the day of the Easter Sunday. And it's be uh, here in Denver. And the Mass for this Easter Sunday, day mass, the Epistle for this Easter Sunday, day Mass, taken from St. Paul, 1st of the Corinthians, chapter 7, and chapter 5. Brethren, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new paste, as you are unleavened. For Christ our past is sacrificed. Therefore, let us feast not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And in the Gospel. I think that's going to see Mark, chapter 16. At that time, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought sweet spices that, coming, they might anoint Jesus. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they come to the sepulcher, the sun being now risen. And they said one to another, Who shall roll back the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And looking, they saw the stone rolled back, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed with a white robe, and they were astonished, who said to them, Be not affrighted, you see Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen, he is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There you shall see him as, as he told you. Those were the words of today's Holy Gospel. <coughs> Today, a few considerations on this victory of the Easter. And St. Augustine points out, on Good Friday, everyone meets Christ. Nobody misses him on Good Friday. His friends and his enemies are all there. Everyone is there. But on Easter Sunday, it is not quite the same. And in those 40 days, between Easter Sunday and the Ascension, remember 40 is the number of perfection. 40 days signifies the whole of time. Forty days and forty nights, the rain fell upon the earth. And for forty days and forty nights, there was a flood. And in these forty days and forty nights, those who were protected from the water, they were inside the boat with Noah. And there were animals there, as well as Noah and his three sons and their wives. And everyone who was touched by that water that was outside the boat they all died, and they all drowned, and it took 40 days of rain. So that there will be judgment during the whole of the 40 days. There are 40 days, 40, 40 days between the creation and the end of the world. 40 days between creation and the flood. 40 days between the flood and Christ. 40 days between Christ and the end of the world. And the whole is 40 days. And during those 40 days, rain is coming down. Rain's coming down from heaven and it's landing upon the unjust. And that rain is those who fall by the those who are outside of the of the ark of our holy mother, the church, those who are not with Noah on that boat, they the waters come to them and they are drowned. And this is the water that when God came down, he said to, to, to Noah, he said, There's a most terrible thing, this kind of water. For it is a most terrible death to die by water, and I will never destroy the world by water again. And in a sign of this, I'll put a rainbow in the sky. Because yesterday we had a double rainbow. Tell me over the over the in, in Kentucky, there a double rainbow. They want to put a rainbow in the sky to remind you that I will never destroy the world by this water again. But there is another water. And this water flows during the 40 days between our Lord Jesus Christ rising from the dead at 3 o'clock in the morning in the dark 
and his ascended into heaven. This also is 40 days. We say fight fire with fire. Well, God will fight water with water. The water in which we are immersed, why is it that the God made a boat? He made a boat because we don't live well in water. We were meant to breathe air. We were meant to be exposed to the sky. But in water, when we try to stand on it, we go beneath the water and beneath the waves, and we discover that we don't have gills. And we discover that we can't breathe in the water. And the ground is so very far down. The bottom of the ocean is so very far down, and therefore we drown. And all those that are in this water of the ocean, they all drown. Remember that the water and the water, there was a water that met the Jews on that most wonderful day mentioned so many times all throughout the Old Testament. That most sacred day when and they were constrained on every side and they were backed up against the water that would kill them, backed up against the water that they would have remembered that brought death to all their ancestors except for Noah and his family. All mankind was wiped out, and they were backed against the water on one side, and surrounded by the enemies of God on all the other sides. They were constrained, but they were saved by the water. God decided, I will not kill you by this water. Therefore, as we learn in the book of Exodus, the water parted, and the water became a wall of water on one side and a wall of water on the other, and the ground became exceeding dry. There was no mud upon it, and 600,000 men of the followers of Moses, along with their wives and children, went into this water, into this land, and with water on either side. And they were saved by the water. And then remember, shortly afterwards, that same water was not so happy. He was not so happy with Pharaoh. That same water was not so happy with him. So when Pharaoh and his armies went into the water, that water revisited them and destroyed the entire army. Now we consider this sacred water, which has two powers. One thing the water does is it wipes out those that hate God. It wipes out his enemies. And the other thing the water does is it saves his friends. And hence we have a vision of the prophet. And he said, and I saw water, we sing about it in this Easter's time, Vidyakwam. I saw water flowing out from the, from the right side of the temple, and those to whom the water came, they were saved. I saw water flowing out. And this water flowed out in one particular moment, when after the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, a soldier came and pierced his side. And when the soldier pierced his side, water came out. Now even though our Lord was pierced, the soldier was standing on the ground, and he pierced the side of our Lord, St. Longinus did that, and he pierced the side of our Lord, and it passed through, he pierced on the right side, the heart's on the left side, but the Romans always pierced on the right side. It used to be one of the arguments of the anti-Catholics. It says in the scripture that Longinus pierced Christ on the right side the old mockers of the, our religion would say. And yet it says he pierced his heart, whereas the heart is on the left side. Were the Romans stupid? No, they were not. In fact, Romans used to carry a sword with them, a short sword, and they were trained in battle. That one of the problems in battle, if you have a spear or a sword, is there's something called ribs. We don't just have heart, we also happen to have ribs. And when you decide, if you are to pierce someone directly in the heart, you might break your sword, and if you have a spear, you could by putting it from the heart, the, the spear will go into the heart, and if you turn the spear sideways, when you pull the spear out, the, the tip of the spear will get caught on the ribs, and you'll come out with a stick and not a spear. And it turns out that this guy's got friends. <laughs> and you don't want to fight him with a stick, you want to fight him with a spear. And so they train, the Romans train their soldiers, says you can get his heart, but there's a trick. Don't go for the left side. Don't go for the heart. You drive down. You jump down. The Romans had a technique where they would jump down on the ground. And they thought they were being cowards. And then they would go up right through the right side, pierced below the ribs. The, the sword would go straight up into the heart. 
kill the person, and then when you pull out the spear, you still got a tip. And you miss every bone, and you got a dead man on your hands. They would also train them in the spear, in the battle, with their short sword, they prefer the short sword. One of the reasons they prefer the short sword is because when it's close combat, the long sword is difficult to wield. But the short sword, you can go under the shield into that same spot. That was the Roman sweet spot. <laughs> you get into that same spot and you go up through the gut and into the heart, pull it out, and he's not wounded. You don't want the enemy wounded, you want him dead. So they knew about piercing the right side in order to get to the left. They knew about piercing the side in order to, to, to kill. And therefore now he, the Longinus, did what he did many, many times before. This wasn't his first time. And he pierced the side of Christ on the side, missed all the bones, went straight into his heart and killed him. But of course the Lord was already dead, making sure he was dead. And then he pulled out and water flowed down the spear and hit his hand. And here is the first beginning of the fulfillment of the prophecy that begins with Longinus and will continue until the very ending of the world. And that is, the water will come out from the heart of Christ. But what should it have done? The blood did not touch the hand of Longinus. The water did. The water came. The blood came and the water came and the water came all the way down and hit his hand. It should have dripped out on the ground. But this water is alive and the water goes to whom it will. And when Isaiah said his prophecy, he said, this water is different, for the water flows on the right side of the temple. But it's like these tomahawk missiles, it's a smart bomb. It is a water that flows, but it can go around buildings, it can go up and down, it goes where it wills. Water, we learned in our, in our class of science that water flows downhill. This water flows uphill, it flows downhill, it flies through the air, and it goes wherever it will. And then he noticed, consider the vision of Isaiah, I saw water flowing out from the right side of the temple. And the water went, it went all over the place. And the water went around one man, the water went around another, the water went beneath one and over another, but to whom the water came, they were saved. To whom the water came. And here we must remember the teaching of the greatest of all theologians and saints, St. Thomas Aquinas. God's grace is unstoppable. God cannot be stopped in the fulfillment of his holy will. As you read in the first lesson on Holy Saturday, Et facta, et, 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 et facta sunt ita, et facta est ita, et facta est ita, et facta est ita. And it was so, and it was so, and it was so, and it was so. God said at the very light, and it was so. And it happened, it was made, it was made, it was made, it was made. God said, and it was made. God said, and it happened. That's the way our world began, and that's the way it will end. And every single moment in between, God says, and it happens. His water flows, and it will not be held back from anyone whom he wishes to receive it. They will not be able to lock him out. We read in the Lamentations on Good Friday. We read in the Lamentations of Jeremiah. And he made a prophecy of Christ about all the sufferings, but all the things that had happened to him and all the terrible uh, 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 mockery and pain that he experienced. And he said, and they have laid a stone over me and I am covered in a pit and I am cut off. These words Jeremiah said concerning Christ, they have laid a stone over me and I am in a pit and I am cut off. Consider this stone that these soldiers, with great effort, had to pick up and roll in front of that tomb. And they sealed it, and it was a very great and very heavy stone. And why did they do that? To make sure that Christ cannot come out. And he's dead. But he wishes to come out. And you must remember about the power of the grace of God. The water flows, and the water cannot be stopped. It will flow for 40 days. 
Let us consider this first day. No one found Christ on this day. No one found him. Christ found whom he wanted. Mary Magdalene was walking around in a garden, not knowing what to do, trying to find him. And there a stranger appeared in front of her. A gardener appeared in front of her. Where did he come from? Or as St. Augustine might say, more importantly, where was he going? Christ was very busy on this day of Easter. He was visiting many places. But they did not know what places did he visit. He was in a garden on this day. He was at the graveyard where St. Mary Magdalene was. He was also around the other side of the garden where Peter was wandering off not knowing what to do. He went into a room that was locked and sealed where terrified apostles were trying to protect themselves and they had every kind of bolt on the door. And he went through the door. He had a couple of idiotic disciples that decided to leave town. <laughs> and he intercepted them. What did Christ do? He had to run around to gather his scattered sheep. Did he miss one? We go back to Holy Thursday night. Imagine what Christ's spirit must have been like. When the apostles heard him say these words, but they did not understand, he finished his prayer of the gospel that is recorded in St. John chapter 17. And he said, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And he has not, and they have not lost even one. We got to remember the history of the world can be seen like a besieging of a city. Now, it was a custom in the besieging of the city. He used to live in one of those forts, in the Bassine Fort in Versailles. In the Bassine Fort in Versailles, there was the main land gate. It was built on the sea. The south fort with 100 acres, a wall, 100 acres around. Inside the wall, we had our orphanage, lived inside the wall. It was illegal to live there. It's India, so there are about a thousand people living there. <laughs> and so we were inside the wall with our with our neighbors in an illegal orphanage that's been there forever. And our illegal house surrounded by our illegal neighbors. <laughs> because after all, it's a national heritage site, you can't live there. So we live there. And a hundred acre wall all the way around. Now the land gate wall, when you go to the land gate wall, it was it was the wall was about 35, 40 feet wide. You're not getting a cannonball through that wall. And they had the custom of the land gate. Now, with that, in the land gate, there, is a, there, is a, there are two gates. There is a gate on the outside, which faces the land. And then there is like a, like a double J. The, 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 there is a hallway coming in, shaped like a J, and then another J going the other way. So you come in one J, walk down a, a, a hallway, and then another J, and then you reach the second gate, and that gets you back into the main fort. So what they would do whenever they were besieged, soldiers would go out the first gate, and an entire army would go out the first gate, and they would lock the first gate. They would be standing between the first and the second gate. Then they would open up the gate, the second gate. And then they would make a counterattack against the enemy that was besieging them. They would go out of the second gate and attack the enemy. Then there would be the gatekeepers, and the gatekeepers would stand on the wall, and they would look at the gate, and then the, 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 the other, their soldiers would retreat. And when they would retreat, they would be the most vulnerable. So oftentimes, the enemy would attack, and they would try to get in the gate. And the gatekeeper was told, I don't care how many enemy get in the gate. You don't close the gate until you see the last of our soldiers get back in the gate. Don't even look at the enemy. And so the gatekeeper would look at the gate and he would see 100, 200, 300, 500, 1,000 enemy get into the gate. But there's still one guy who's kind of slow out there. And he would say, hurry up, you idiot. And he would, he would not close that gate until the very last man came in. And then they closed the gate. And then there's a problem. There's 500 guys, 1,000 guys that got in that gate. And they discover there's another gate in front of them. There's a gate behind them. 
There's a wall this side and a wall that side. A lot of unhappy people on the top with arrows and guns <laughs> and rocks and oil. It wasn't a good idea to run past that gate. And they were slaughtered. But they would never close the gate. You know, there's an angel who blows the trumpet at the end of the world. There is an angel. We know about that angel. He's going to blow the mighty trump. And when he blows the trump, Christ is coming from the east to the west. But there's another angel in charge of the gate. I want to blow the trump. Wait. <laughs> Just a minute. Wait. Just a minute. Wait. There's another guy over here. Boy, he's slower. He's really slow. But wait. <laughs> this guy's rolling in. That guy's in a wheelchair. But we will not blow the trump. Until the very last one gets in. Until the very last one is safe. And then the gate will be closed. And don't worry about the idiots that tried to get through. They'll be taken care of. And what is the history of this world? It is the history of 40 days. 40 days of rain. That brought about the death of the enemies of God. And their eternal judgment. They will sleep with the fishes. Forever. <laughs> That is going to be the eternal judgment of those fools who mocked the church, of those fools who would not get into it, of those fools who made fun of the animals that decided to get on the boat. But then there will be the others. There is the other water. And this is the water that flows out from the right side. It flows today. It will continue to flow until the very ending of the world. The water flows out from the right side. And to whom the water came, look for that water. It is the water of sanctifying grace. It is the water of the divine love. It is the water of the victory of Christ. And this water shall not be stopped. And remember that first man that received the water before St. Mary Magdalene would see him. The very first one that would see the water, he was a wicked soldier who in hatred pierced the side of Christ. He was vicious. He was in sin. He did not love God, but God loved him. And he got the privilege of blowing the last blow. And so from our Lord Jesus Christ said, this is my sacred heart. This is my divine body. It received millions and millions of blows. I will make sure whoever strikes the final blow, that one shall be overcome by my grace. That one I am going to make into a saint. And that one was Longinus. And he pierced the side of Christ, and he pierced the most sacred heart, and out came water, and I saw water flowing out. And what is the duty of the priest of God during these 40 days? That is the history of our own life, that is the history of our own world. It is his duty to warn those, beware of the water, and to tell the others, have confidence in the water. For there is water and water, there is a water that will make walls that will defend us. And there is a water that will flow across our foreheads. A water that will enter our hearts. And this water shall bring victory to us. And today is the day of the flowing of the sacred water. Because Christ went out. And he went to Mary Magdalene. She didn't know where to go. He went to St. Peter. He went inside the upper room to his apostles. Eight days later... He would come back to that upper room. And there were 11, 12, 11 men there. But he only came for one. And that was Thomas. Everybody else ran to the gate, but Thomas was slow. Thomas was an idiot. Thomas wouldn't believe. Thomas was weak. Thomas was hurt. Why did Thomas not believe? The official reason is because he was a scientist. The official reason is because he was a man of facts. And he wanted to see the facts. What's the real reason? His feelings were hurt. Our Lord showed up when he was out getting a pack of cigarettes. Couldn't he have waited five minutes? I was out getting a pack of cigarettes and come back, we saw the Lord. What do you mean you saw him? Couldn't he wait for me? We don't need you. His feelings were hurt. You see, we have deep theological reasons why we don't believe. I want to see the evidence. 
what's the evidence? You hurt my feelings. <laughs> the fact is, Thomas was a priest. He was not as wicked as Caiaphas. Caiaphas was hurt also. Caiaphas was jealous. And Caiaphas did not believe because he wanted Christ. He did, wanted to be more popular than Christ. He saw people going to Christ and he had jealousy and envy. Thomas didn't believe because he was hurt. He was just hurt. That's all. There's the official reason and then there's a the real reason. And Christ came in and said, Thomas, I'm not here to see these other ten guys. I'm here for you. He walked into that upper room, and what did he do? The water came to Thomas, and he became Saint Thomas. From doubting Thomas, from weak Thomas, from emotionally scarred Thomas, who needed to see a counselor, <laughs> he became Thomas the Great. He became Thomas who had such a great heart that he could carry Christ to the very ends of the earth. And his hand mark remains until the ending of the world. His hand mark is there. His right hand is on a stone that continues to grow. And it will continue to grow until the world comes to an end. Thomas is still performing a miracle every day. Because one day Christ visited him. And Christ said, Thomas, put your hands into the place of the nails. And he did. He did. What is this miracle of this holy resurrection? It's nothing for Christ to rise from the dead. He's God. Mm. It's easier for him to rise from the dead than it is for us to breathe. He just rose from the dead. There's nothing special about that. Mm. The special is he decided to stay three days in the tomb. And why well, did he do that? For us. And then he rose from the dead. And what's interesting is not that he rose from the dead because he's God. He rose, Of course he rose from the dead. Very easy, like breathing. But what did he do? He went to the hearts of his sheep. He went to the hearts of his shepherd. He went to the hearts, and he will continue to go to the hearts until the very ending of the world. On the last day, there will be a coward somewhere. There will be someone who doesn't know what, who doesn't believe, who's terrified of all the wrong things. And the angel, the tough angel, I'm going to blow the trump. You just got to wait one minute, son. I'm the angel in charge of the gate. And you don't close, blow that trump until I close this gate. It ain't closed. <laughs> There's still someone ready to come. And every single soul, there isn't one that is forgotten. There isn't one that shall be left out. Which is also why it says in sacred scripture in the Holy Gospel, on Holy Thursday night, our Lord said, Wherever I am, there also my minister will be. The minister will somehow get to where he needs to go. We don't know how we're going to get there. It's not important. Habakkuk made a really nice lunch for himself one day. <laughs> Didn't eat it. He made a really nice lunch. An angel came, grabbed the hair head, said, That's not for you, that's for Daniel. <laughs> and so he said, How do I get to Daniel? He's in the lion's den. He's behind a big rock. Daniel's hungry. He wants your sandwich. <laughs> and Habakkuk was very happy to give it to Daniel. But he had a problem. I have a problem with Daniel. I'm not scared of lions, but how do you get past the soldiers, the city, and the man, the ones who really take off people? Yeah, I got no problem with him. How do we do this? That's not my problem. Habakkuk was very wise. An angel took him and brought him past. By the hair of his head, by the way, it doesn't mean he got him by his hair, which he may have. It means he brought him fast. It's a Jewish expression for he went fast. So most likely Habakkuk grabbed his food and he ran, and he ran. And he acted like one of my parishioners in the past did. He wanted to see Cardinal Manzini. Cardinal Manzini came to New York. And he went to New York and they said that it was locked. There was no tickets. So he was one of these big uh, talker guys. And he, well, he was walking up. How do we get Cardinal Manzini? And just then cops came down the road, sacred police, with Cardinal Manzini. With, where, where, where's the entrance to the place? He, he said, well, it's right here. Just follow me, follow me. <laughs> He said, this is one of these doors. He goes, you check the door? It's locked. Oh, it's locked. Go around, get the key, bring it back. So, okay, so they thought he was like one of the guys in charge. Of the, uh, what do you call it, uh, where they do the uh, basketball. You know, in New York. You know, so he got to get him, bring him in. And then he said, it can't be that hard to find a stage. 
he made some wrong turns, and they, the more wrong he thought going through, he went through the kitchen, he went through, yeah, this guy really knows his stuff. <laughs> He's taking us the secret route. <laughs> and as he kept making wrong turns, he said, oh, we're going this way, let's go this way, it's safer. <laughs> you know, and then he finally gets up to the stage, and they really thought he was the main man in charge. <laughs> he sat on stage right next to Carter Mazzini. <laughs> and then he said, just a minute, he went to the front door, went to the front door, and when he was in the front door, the people were coming in. His wife came up, and they said, hey, they said to this woman here, she, they said, go up to the front, not the front row, but the second row, four seats down, number five, six, and seven, that's their seats. Mm. Somebody didn't get to sit there that day. And that's probably all happened with going in. He ran in, and the guard said, what are you doing? i got to bring food. Okay, get out of the way. Get out of the way. And he went all the way in, opened up the lion's den. Oh, okay, you're in your tongue the guy in charge. Went down, fed him. Okay, I can come out now. And he came out. But Habakkuk went with haste. How he went, we don't know. But he ran to that tomb because he didn't worry about how to get to Daniel. The angel said, get to Daniel. He needs bread. He needs lunch. Don't let it get cold. And so he ran to Daniel. We worry about the wrong things. Just like this holy morning. What did the holy men worry about? They said, who's going to roll back the stone? It's really heavy. They worried about the wrong things. But the angel said, you came to this tomb. Look at the place where they ate him. Maybe you're worried about the wrong things. Maybe you're about murs and aloes you shouldn't have done. Maybe your brain isn't turned on at will. Maybe you forgot what he taught. Maybe you don't believe in his miracles. But you know what? You came to his tomb. And he wanted you to come. Maybe you didn't think about it all the right ways. Look at the place where they laid him. And go tell Peter and the apostles. And what happened that day? Womanhood was healed because one day, 4,000 years before that, a woman was talked to an angel, and the angel said, you can eat this forbidden fruit. And she said, I'm going to tell my husband about it, and I'm going to get him to eat the forbidden fruit. And the woman was cursed. And on this day, women went to a tomb, and they spoke to an angel. And then he said, all right, fix the problem of your grandma. <laughs> Fix the problem. Go and tell Peter. Go and tell the apostles. Go and tell the disciples. Because if you don't tell them, if you girls don't tell them, they're staying locked up there until we got to tell the smell, <laughs> until the body rots. <laughs> so go and tell them. And they went and told them. And womanhood was healed on that day. The Lord heals everything. The water came, and they were instruments to carry the water to St. Peter and the apostles. And St. Peter and John ran to the tomb, and Christ saw them. Two disciples didn't get it. They decided to run away. So Christ intercepted them and talked to them the entire day. And they recognized him in the breaking of the bread. But the water is going to flow. The water will flow until the ending of the world. If we're behind locked doors... If we are running away because we don't understand, if we don't get it and we're going to the tomb but for the wrong reasons and without the right materials with us, God will still bless. He is going to go to all those whom he loves. Let us ask that we are amongst those whom he loves with a special love. And we need to return that love to Christ. And no matter how many of the bad guys go after us, they cannot succeed because that little drop of water that came with a drop of blood out of the side of Christ is more powerful than all the oceans of the world. And it's the water also that he spoke to a woman about. You drink of this water at Jacob's well. You drink of that water and you're thirsty. Whoever drinks of my water, they shall never thirst again. Let us drink of that water. And she said very wisely, Give me the water so I don't have to come here anymore. She's a very practical girl. <laughs> Give me the water I don't have to come here anymore. And Christ gave her the water. And what happened? She ran into the city and she told all her, all her enemies and all of the uh, people about it. They weren't her friends. And they ran out to see that he was the Christ. And they believed the water of grace is more powerful than the wickedness of men. And we must have confidence in the water of grace that flows on this most sacred day of the resurrection. It flows on the right side, and to whomever the water comes, they are saved, and there will be no exceptions until the ending of the world.
Blessed are you, Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.